we would like to uh, introduce you to the software embroidery line of G7 Solutions and Designs and Machine Embroidery. Our inspiration software line includes My Block Pacer, My Quilt Embellisher, My Quilt Planner, Perfect Embroidery Pro, Perfect Stitch Viewer, and Word Art and Stitches. Tonight's webinar features our My Quilt Embellisher and My Block Pacer. We have a wonderful team tonight assisting us, Inspiration Tech Support Team of Nancy R., Dory, and Chris L. And I would like to introduce you to our very own artiste, Tamara Evans. Again, thank you for joining us and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Dory, and welcome everyone. Tonight we're going to talk about artwork. And artwork does so many things in almost all of the Inspiration Software programs. The ones we're going to focus on tonight, of course, as Dory mentioned, are My Block Piecer and My Quilt Embellisher. And a lot of the functions are the same. So we'll go through what's the same first, and then we'll distinguish between what's unique with each program and what you can do with the artwork. On my screen here, I have displayed a block from our block catalog, which the icon is up in the top left-hand corner on the second row of icons. So you can select any of these blocks. And as we have discussed before, all of these are artwork blocks. So I have brought one up on the screen, and it has three colors in it. So let's just take a look at some of the properties with artwork. First of all, if I select um, any part of this block and click on it, it shows me my artwork properties right here. The type is filled. It could be filled or it could be an outline. In this case, it's filled, so we can see it better. And a lot of times I use fill just for the visual, not that it has to be filled to do the function we want to do, but the visual helps. The next thing is the opacity. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. If I want to change this so it's not solid, so I could see through it and perhaps even see the grid behind, I could change that to instead of 100%, let's make it 50% and apply it. And now I can still see, oops, let's get it back up there. I can still see my artwork and with it selected and it's got the lines going through it showing me it's selected. If I let go of the selection, my artwork is still there, but it's a faint blue color. So I could actually see the grid lines underneath. Sometimes that's very important. But right now, we don't need to. So let me undo that. Up here at the top row, my undo, my favorite button. You could also do Control-Z or alternate backspace, whichever one is easiest for you. The other properties we have, which have been added recently, and we're not going to go into a lot of depth with it today, but if you want to make the outline of this block or the stroke width bigger so that you can see it, it's outlined, so if you're printing a template or something like that, it might be helpful, you can change that. We have it set, which is the default, at one pixel, which is extremely small. If I want to take that off of pixels and make it, um, which would make it inches, I'll make it 0.25 inches and apply that. Now I have a big old outline around that piece of artwork. I could change the color of it instead of it being black if I want to make it, um, oh, I don't know, hot pink. I could apply that. I could also change the outline or that stroke. Um, to dashes or dots. So if I want it to be dashed, it would look like that, which is more like what we see sometimes for cutting lines. So especially if you're doing instructions, that would come in real handy. This is where you cut. Um, you could also make it dotted lines. So if you needed to have um, different nomenclatures depending on what you're doing or to help you remember, uh, by all means, you can change that. But let's go back and select that, and we're just going to change it uh, back to pixels and make it one pixel and a black color and apply. And 
no dashes or dots and apply. Okay, so now we're back where we started. Now the other thing with artwork, I want to drop down now to the sequence box. If I expand the sequence box, I'm going to right click and say expand all. So instead of clicking each, uh, what was a plus sign here to show you, um, it just did them all for me. I have lots of different pieces of artwork. Each one of these patches is a separate piece. And it's unlike backdrops that we discussed last month. So if you're interested in backdrops, um, this is real stuff. This isn't a go by. This is um, actual artwork that has been created that in this program, in my quilt embellisher and my block piecer, you can actually do things with the artwork itself. For example, I can convert any of this artwork to stitches simply by selecting it. And if I hold down my control key, I can select more than one and clicking any of my stitches up here at the top like we've done before. Or I could make this an applique, which is actually what this would be. Click on applique and it makes that applique for me. So you can actually do something with the artwork. Convert it to applique, to a fill. If I want to make this you know, a stipple, I can click on stipple and it will stipple it for me. So um, it's, it's a thing that we can convert. So it's, uh, it's real. I don't have to create artwork and then convert it. This starts off as artwork. So let's go back to our beginning. Um, of this block and you know as we've done many times in the past we've taken these and converted them to stitches and and even uh, into pieced blocks in my block piecer. So that's artwork that exists already in the program and all of that again is up here in the block catalog, the quilt block. And in my quilt embellisher you've got over 2200 blocks in my block piecer, you have um, about 1,100. So you've got a lot of artwork that you can start with. Let's take a closer look now at um, creating artwork. So I'm going to open up a new page right up at the top, control, uh, control N or click the new page. And let's go to our artwork tool. Now, this is how we create our work. Now, unlike PEP, where we can create Perfect Embroidery Pro, where we can create stitches and um, fill stitches and satin stitches and all these different kinds of stitches from scratch, the only things that we can create from scratch in My Quilt Embellisher are artwork and, right next to it, run stitches. We're not going to deal with the runs today. Let's just go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, let's just go to artwork and create uh, some artwork. If you click on the down arrow next to the artwork icon, then it shows you all of the different options that you have to create shapes that are artwork. Let's skip over the pen first and go to the rectangle. When I select that, then I have a square next to my little crosshair on my cursor on the screen and I can simply drag out any kind of rectangle I want. Now this one is um, open. If we look over here at our properties on the right hand side, it's an outline. It's not filled. Uh, it is. It defaults to color number one that I had created which when I created the file which is uh, blue and that's fine. We can make any shape of rectangle that we want. Now, if you want to make a perfect square, let me select all of these and control A and delete. Let's go back up and pick up our rectangle. Now, when I drag this, and I'm going to start at the grid line one and one, and I do have my snap to grid on on my grid properties right here, snap to grid. This is very helpful, both in Quilt Embellisher and in Block Piecer, to get perfect sizes, okay? Especially if you have your grid laid out um, 
in a size that will be helpful for you in creating things. I typically leave mine at a half an inch, but sometimes I will make that a quarter of an inch. Um, rarely do I make it metric, though you could, um, because I don't think in metric. But I'm going to take now and go to um, one inch and one inch. Hold down my control key. Now the control key does something pretty cool here. When I pull this out, you notice it doesn't matter if I'm pulling up or down or sideways, it keeps it a perfect square. So I can pull it out to uh, make a perfect two inch square. The same thing works for the ellipse. If I pull this out, I hold my control key down and pull it out, it's going to make a perfect circle. If I select the triangle, and we're going to start at the same place each time, because I want to show you what's happening here. It makes, whoops, I didn't have my control key selected, so I'll undo. If I select my control key, I get a perfect, acute isosceles triangle. Um, if that fits within that space. All of these are two inches by two inches. Even if I select the next one, which is a diamond, start at the same place, pull it out, it's a diamond on point, or a square on point. If I do the same thing with the star, then I'm going to get a perfect star. That is two inches by two inches. And we'll just keep layering these here. Round, which is a new one I'm really excited about, um, is a rounded corners on a rectangle. So when I pull that out, you can see here that this is what that uh, rounded looks like. Then we'll do the last one, which is a heart, a shape we use frequently. And again, it's two inches by two inches. Now the thing that all of these have in common is that they're the exact same size. Okay, whether it's the triangle or the star or whatever. So if you hold the control key down while you're dragging it, it will give you a, an exact proportional size that fits in a square shape. If I select any one of these, and I'm going to delete the square for, well, nope, delete the square. If I select the star right here, you see when it's outlined, it's a perfect square. So that's the shape that you're, you're filling or that the area that you're filling with that shape. Now, let's um, select all that and delete. And let's look at some of these shapes if we don't hold the control key down. If I do a diamond shape, I can get a diamond with different angles in it, you know, more like an argyle looking diamond. Um, and I can duplicate that, or I could get one that comes way out like this. So you can create any shape you want. All right, um, with those. The same with a triangle. If I'm doing triangles, sometimes if I've got a backdrop and I've got some funky triangles I'm trying to duplicate, then once I get it pulled out the kind of like I want it, then I'll click the shape tool. Over here on the left hand side, your second tool down. And now this allows me to adjust the shape of this triangle. So it's got three nodes on it, or three points. And you notice there's no start, stop. That's because it's artwork. So it just shows us the nodes at this time. And I could pull this over and make it, um, I think that's an obtuse triangle. It's been a long time since I've had uh, geometry. But I could change it and morph that into any shape I want. If I have a diamond and I select it with the shape tool, I could even select two of the points and move both of those so that I get, you know, a funky parallelogram. Tamara, you have gone radio silent. Oh, I'm back. I'm sorry. I've got to put that over my shoulder. It, <laughs> when I lean up against my desk, the button goes right there. 
I'm sorry. So we can fill a shape and make that our default if we choose to. So if I click my artwork and then come over and say fill, now everything I do will be filled automatically. Okay, so whatever shape I make, it will automatically fill it for me. So that's some simple things about making shapes. Let's, uh, and in moving nodes and reshaping them, let's take, uh, let's just open up a new page, and now I want to go to the pin function. Because the pin function is really interesting. You notice I don't have a shape attached to my little crosshair cursor here on the screen, right there. Uh, so I can draw anything I want. Before I start drawing, I want to show you where you set up how you draw. The first one is you go, or the first thing you do is you go up here to Tools and select General Options and go to Digitizing. Now, as I said before, the only thing we can digitize in the software is the artwork and run stitches. And we're not going to do run stitches today. So this is how we're going to dig digitize um, artwork. We can either use the simple draw method, which is the one I use most of the time, um, actually pretty much all the time. If you have a tablet, like a Wacom tablet or something, the bamboo, uh, um, and you can do this as well with a touch screen, but it's not as sensitive as the drawing tablets are. You could do freehand, and then when you draw, you get a pin. And I'm doing this with my cursor, so it's a little wobbly. But I could just, you know, do whatever. It puts all the notes in for me. I right click, and now I have that line created. Let's undo that. Let's look at Tools, General Options, Digitizing, and this time we're going to switch it to Bezier. And click OK. Now, when you do this, you have the option of setting angle lines before, and I think, you know, some people who are very good in artwork can do this very well. Um, I think it's fun to play with, but I have never outlined anything with this particular mode, although I might try it sometime. Um, but it puts all of the nodes in for you again and sets them and sets the curves on them as you're drawing. So let's uh, undo that one and go back and set it in general options, digitizing, and let's change it to simple draw. Now, what Simple Draw does, it is allows you to click wherever you want. Oops, go back to my pen. I can click wherever I want to and draw. If I don't hold any keys down, then I get um, just a note that I, I believe it's a cusp. If I hold the Control key down, then it's going to curve it for me. And because the, this one right here was a cusp, when I do a curve on this one, it makes it curved. If I hold a shift key down, it's going to make it a line so that it's straight on both sides. So I'm just playing around with clicking different things. And when I right click, I have a line. Now this is an open shape because I didn't close it. This is one of our challenges sometimes when we're drawing our artwork or trying to trace something that we go around um, a backdrop, a triangle or something, or we're draw tracing something because it's uh, we want that shape, and it doesn't actually close. We may think it's closed, but it's not. So here's a trick. I want you to you simply Go to your, um, over here on the right-hand side, to your shape key, and you see how it, you see all of the different nodes. I just right-click on it and say, close the line. And there you go. It closed from my last point here to my first point up there. Let's do that again. I'm going to do an undo. So here's my ending point, here's my starting point. Even if those were much closer together, and I think they're closed, you know, they may not be. They may be 
I think that's pretty close there, but if you zoom in a whole, whole lot, you know, those aren't really close at all. So if I click on my shape tool, the second one down, select it, select my object, right click, and say close that line, then it closes it for me. Then I can do things like create an applique that's closed and all sorts of different things. So you can have an open object or you can have a closed object. Um, it just depends on your goal. And we'll put that into a practical application a little bit later on. But I think right now I'm going to stop and ask if there's any questions. Ah, there we go. Hi. Yes, we do. <laughs> we have a question from our friend Barbara. And her question is, so if I have my own quilt block, that I have scanned in and want to use, is that considered a backdrop or artwork? Oh, that would be a backdrop. Because you haven't actually created it. Let me show you what I mean. Let's open up a new page uh, right here. And let me bring up, a, leave my grid on, bring up, click on my backdrop tool and Oh, I'll just bring this block up. Okay, so this has fabric in it and everything. Um, and of course, you would want to set the sizes to, to what you want. But you see, there's nothing in my properties box. This has no properties. It's just a go-by. It's just an image. So if I wanted to create this as artwork, because it's not um, a solid color, I could trace it. And I could take my artwork tool and select rectangles and come over here and draw. And I'm going to, this one doesn't have a clear seam around, allowance all the way around it. Um, so I'm just going to kind of fudge it here. So here's a square. Now if I want to, I could have these done filled so I can see them. And I would probably do it where it's not solid, where the opacity is maybe 50% um, or, or even less. So I can see underneath. Then I might select a triangle right here and come in and let me do one of these because that one's seam allowance, and make a triangle, which looks nothing like the triangle that I'm trying to create. Let me change the color on it here. We'll go back up and make it a fill. And you could set this up ahead of time so that all of them come in filled and with a whatever opaqueness or opacity you want. Now I'm going to go, I've got it selected. I'm going to click on my shape tool here and then simply move my nodes. So I want one here, I want this one over here, and this one right here. And now I've got that triangle done. And I could create my whole block that way. Probably not the most efficient way to do it, but I'm going to teach you that next month. I'm really excited about next month. And hang on till the end of the webinar because you're going to help with next month webinar um, and I'll show you where to send information. So does that answer your question? Art backdrops and artwork. You see now I've got two pieces of artwork in my property in my sequence over here, whereas before I didn't have anything. So a backdrop is really just an image, a hallucination, if you will. Uh, any That's other questions? Good. Yes, our friend Patty asks, when we create in Quilt Embellisher, is it a raster or is it a vector? Very good question. Um, it depends. Um, for the sake of our artwork in the program, it's a, it's a vector file. And depending on how you save it, and we're going to get into that in just a little while, you can save it as a vector file. Um, actually, in this program, you can't save it as a raster file. But if you want to save the artwork as vector files, you can. Very good. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. Okay? Okay. All right. Okay. 
So let's move on. We talked a little bit about nodes, and we're going to talk a lot more about the nodes next week uh, or next month. Uh, as far as what you can do with them and change them. But I encourage you, between now and then, go in and play with them. If you, uh, let's open up a new page. Uh, another way that we can play with artwork is using a backdrop. Instead of just outlining things on it like we just did, if we use a backdrop that has a clear image, for example, um, let's do, well, Let's do, eh, let's do something to, as an applique. Let's do this butterfly. I'm going, and I'm in Quilt Embellisher. Now, the same thing works in Block Piecer, although in Block Piecer, we don't have the applique function. So, but I'll show you when we get to Block Piecer what you can do with the artwork there. You can create blocks like are in your, your Quilt Block Library. So here I have a very clear image. Again, if you look in the sequence view on the bottom, right-hand side, there's no items in there. So it doesn't see anything except showing you this picture that then you can create artwork from. So I'm going to come up here and select my artwork tool. I'm going to come over to the right-hand side to the properties and make that a fill because I like to be able to see it. Then I can select different colors down at the bottom. Let's say Oh, we can even change them. I want to make the blue more of a lavender, like the butterfly here, which uh, we'll do larkspur. That's pretty. And then I could come in and trace around this, you know, using a simple draw method, boom, boom, you know, and trace. But frankly, that bores me. Um, so what I'm going to do instead, I'll escape and select my magic wand. Now the magic wand is right next to the artwork tool. What a magic wand does is it reads a backdrop for color. So it sees all of this lavender color and says, oh, I know what that is. If I right click on it, I'm sorry, left click, then right click, well, left click, have I got the color so close? Oh, no, it's still doing an outline. Hang on. I didn't set that. Let's change that to a fill and apply. Okay, let me do that again. We'll select our artwork. And you notice I haven't selected a shape. Because I'm using the magic wand, it sees the shape and selects it. So I'm going to make it filled by default and apply this time so it will actually fill it. And then simply click on the color and it adds it for me. Now I can change to green for the bottom, click, and click. Now I do want to show you something here that's kind of, kind of interesting. If I remove over here in the properties box, if I change the stroke width to zero and apply, we're not going to see that black outline around these. And apply. And I could actually select everything by doing a control A or dragging my um, selection tool around it and change the stroke width to zero or the color to none and apply. So we don't have that black outline. So now if I dismiss the backdrop, I have wings, uh, well, four wings or two sets of wings, um, however you want to look at it. And from that, I could actually uh, select them all. I'll do a control A to select them all. And then all of my convert to stitches are up here. I could convert them to applique. And now I have my applique. Now, we're going to talk about this overlap here in just a minute. So don't get worried about, oh, the applique is overlapping the other applique. We're going to take care of that, and I'll show you how to fix that in, in just a minute. But what the point I was trying to illustrate is from uh, the software, you can take artwork and convert it to any of these stitches up here. Let's undo it, do an undo. Everything's still selected. We could convert it to uh, a texture stitch. We'll pick one of those, pick that one, 
and we've got it converted. So we have green ones and purple ones and so on and so forth. Uh, so from artwork, I can get pretty much anywhere that I want to go in the software. Let's take another look, and we'll do one that's a little bit more complex or, or that I want to do a couple of different things with. I'm going to open up a new file. Let's bring up a backdrop, which again is just a backdrop. It's not artwork. It's a go-by. Um, it's a hallucination from which we can create whatever we want. So I have a necktie in here, right there. And I'm going to open that. And of course, I want to resize my backdrop before I go any further, because I want to make it the right, end up the right size. Right now, it's only about an inch and a half wide. I'm going to put a big necktie on some t-shirts, which I actually did for Christmas for the guys in the family, uh, pajamas. And I'm going to make that, we'll make it three inches wide and it adjusts the height proportionally, and click Apply. Now, let's double click on our uh, uh, Zoom tool here, and it brings it back into, so I can see the whole thing. Now, I want the knot to go one way, and the tie fabric to go another. I did this with um, plaid fabric on, on t-shirts, plaid flannel. So, I want it to look like a real tie because the knot always kind of goes, if it's striped or a directional print, goes a different way. So here's how I'm going to create this. I'm going to select my pen and I'm going to draw, click here, come down to this point and click, and I could actually use my control key to make this, ooh, no I don't want to do that. Uh, I can click here. And I'm just going to uh, click these two. If I want to make that curve, then I need to make the other one, you know, uh, the one before it, an absolute line. So by holding the shift key. So now I have that outlined. And because I had set my default at fill, it filled it, even though this isn't connected across the top. It's open. Let's convert this, select it, and I will convert it to an applique. And you see it's still open. All right. Now I want to do the top part of it, so let's zoom up. And let's see what happens if I just use the magic wand. I'm going to select the magic wand, click on the gold part, and it creates a shape, but it's kind of messy. Let's dismiss the backdrop. Um, woo, that's really kind of jagged. So I'm going to clean that up a little bit before I convert it to an applique. See all these little nodes? I can actually drag a selection tool around those and then just hit delete on my keyboard to get rid of all that squiggly stuff. And I'm going to delete these. And it may have been easier just to create it all on its own, but you never know. So let's make it smooth up at the top, except I want it to come down just a little bit like a knot. So while I'm still in the uh, uh, reshape mode, I'm going to right click and say add a point right here. I'm going to add it, just make it a slight curve there. I think I'll do one down here as well. Add a point, and make that a little bit of a curve. And there you go. Select it, click on Applique, ta-da, I'm done. Now, to cut these out, I want a template, or maybe I want to cut them on my cutter, but I've already created appliques. So it doesn't matter when you do this. Maybe you have an applique pattern already that um, you purchased from someplace, or that you've created yourself, but you don't have the artwork. All I have to do, I'm going to select the whole thing, oops, select the whole thing, and I'm going to copy it and paste it. Now I have one applique on top of another. I'm going to change that to red, and you can see I've got the blue appliques and the red applique. I'm going to select the red, and I can convert that to artwork with a click. And if I send it to the back, 
Now I have artwork that I can use for a template, and I still have my applique design. There's a, there's, there's a couple of things I can do at this point. I can save the whole design, which is the way I typically save my applique with the, with the artwork and the applique design together, because then I don't have to find two files, I just do have to find one. But I can also select uh, or choose to save this by doing File, Export Artwork. And I will call that uh, Necktie. And I can select to save it in any one of these artwork formats. I can save it in SVG if I have a Silhouette or a Sizzix or some of the other brands of cutters um, and cut those out. It will save it in a format that I can take directly to my cutter. I can save it in an FCM file for the Brother Scan and Cut. Then we have all of these other graphic uh, formats like Adobe Illustrator, a plotter file. Um, if you have a commercial uh, cutter, it uses a PLT or perhaps it uses a DXF. But I can use it, save it in any of those formats, which are common uh, industry standard formats, and then have a cut file as well as an applique file. So I would simply save that. Like you see, I have other SVG files up here that I've saved. Those are all cut files and save it, and then save the entire file as a stitch file um, to stitch it out. And then, of course, I'm going to save it as the C2S, which is our native format, so it saves the artwork, and it saves the applique, and it knows everything that I've done to this, so, or, or what all the parts are. It knows that's an applique, it knows that's artwork. I could even come in and add fabric to this, and it would save that information as well. Okay, so I think that's another good stopping point for um, questions. Uh, speaking of fabric, can we bring in our own fabric, or do we are we just controlled by the fabric um, information that was given to us at installation? Oh, absolutely not. You're not controlled by anything, honey. You are in, whoever asked that, you are in control of everything. Yes, you can add your own fabric. In fact, um, there's a uh, webinar called Getting Your Library Card, and we talked about the fabric library in there and how you add fabrics to it, whether you scan them, photograph them, or pull images off the Internet. It matters not, and you can sort them any way you want to. But to put fabric with this, I'm not getting my selection uh, out big enough. I simply select it and I come here to which since we have done those uh, we now have a fabric icon on the properties that we can select the fabric. If I click on the three dots next to it it takes me into all the fabrics that we may have out there. Um, here are some from my fabric designs. Let's do elephants. Wouldn't that be fun? Well, those are a little bit big scale. Uh, but we can change the scale. Let's make that 5%. Let's see, oh, 5%. Let's see what that does. Oh, now we have elephants all over the place. Um, so yes, and we'll do some more on, on fabrics um, at another time. But play with them because it's so fun to visualize, you know, exactly what you're going to stitch. Oh, and we can change the, uh, on the fabric, we could also change the rotation on this and make it 90 degrees so that the elephants, are you there? <laughs> I'm here. Well, I'll have to work on that one. <laughs> uh, oh, let's do it 180. Maybe that'll work. No, nope, I don't know if I'm not selecting it properly or what. Um, but it doesn't like my rotation. So anyway, we will uh, work on that on a later date. I haven't played with that much yet. It's a brand new feature in the software. So um, any other questions before we move on? Nope. Nope. We're good. All right. Okay. So we talked about exporting artwork. We can also import artwork. So if you have a, a design that has been done or drawn somewhere else, or you have another program that creates artwork, like an Adobe Illustrator file or um, any 
type of artwork file. Let's open up a new file here first. I can import artwork by selecting File, Import Artwork. And I have some things saved out here that we could import, um, like an SVG file. Uh, let's see, what would be fun? Here's a feather oval. Hmm, that's interesting. I have lots, so I could take that and convert it to a run stitch design. This one's a fun one. I'm going to open that. So here's artwork. Now, when you import artwork, such as this file, um, and this is actually just a series of circles that are overlapped perfectly, which I would never do since I uh, lost my spirograph. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it gives you this beautiful design that would be a beautiful quilting design, but see, it's all artwork. All I have to do here is, first of all, I want to select the entire design. And let's look at the size, because a lot of times when you import artwork, it is extremely large. This is actually uh, about 104 inches square, which would be that one design would fill up a king-size bedspread. So let's change that to something that um, is hoopable in one hooping. Let's make it a 7-inch design and apply, then zoom in to see it. Now, if I convert that to a run stitch right here, click Run, and it converts it. Let's look at it in 3D and get rid of the grid. And there we go. We've got a beautiful quilting design. How simple was that? Um, it's got this great dimension and curves to it. I'm going to have to stitch that one out. If you wanted to make it... Um, even from this point, let's select everything and change it to a bean stitch or a two-ply. Then we'll get a lot more definition with it because, or, or emphasis in it because it's got more stitches that the repeats of the stitches there will stand out more. So you have a beautiful design um, by importing artwork. We can do the same thing with appliques. If you have a design you want to import and make it an applique, just watch your sizes. And when you import designs or you import artwork, oops, that was exporting. Let's open up a new file. File, import artwork. These are the, your options in terms of types of files. So if you have a, a silhouette file, that's an SVG or a scan and cut file, that's a, a, the brother scan and cut, that's an FCM, plotter files, DXF, encapsulated postscript, all of these different types of files you can import directly as artwork instead of having, and because these are all uh, vector files, instead of using a raster file like we would have to as a backdrop and then tracing it or using the magic wand to to make it into artwork. This converts directly into artwork, so we can import that right into our, our um, software. Okay, now before I switch to my block piecer and go over some of the nuances with that, do we have any more questions on my quilt embellisher in terms of artwork? Yes, can we go over some of the places, the resources that um, we can go to for free design? Oh, sure. Um, you know, one place, and I do it a lot with quilt blocks that, that I'll play with them, and, and some appliques and things, would be, um, I use EQ7. I have a silhouette cutter, and I get free SVG or not free, sometimes I buy them, sometimes they're free, SVG designs that I can pull right into here, as well as take my artwork I've created and save it as an SVG. There's also um, just going online, and we'll just go out on a limb here. Let me add a new, uh, and go, um, you know, I like free, vector, line, art, quilting. Or you could type in whatever you want, if you want to do bugs or what have you. And I always go to the images to see them. 
and you can see all kinds of different designs. Oh, here's a little quilt bag. Yes, story. Okay. No, I was not, but um, now that okay. you mention it, yes, I will. <laughs> um, please make sure that these designs are royalty free because we absolutely do not want to uh, go out of the boundaries of appropriateness. Thank you very much for pointing that out, and that's a very good point. And we, no, we wouldn't want to do that. But you could also, you know, uh, this one's really cute. Chins? Hmm. Um, you know, have have people design for you. If you have Adobe Illustrator or if you have other, you can buy lots of vector artwork. There's artwork all over the place um, that you can import uh, into here. Ooh, that would be a cute quilt design. Um, so, yes, don't steal, steal someone else's. Make sure it's free and that you're allowed to use it, um, most importantly. Another thing that um, if you have PEP, you can do is export. Um, you can bring in true type fonts and create artwork out of them and save it and then bring it into here. Um, I do have have also, for those of you who don't have PEP, uh, if you take your true type fonts, and I have one in here, that, and make it really large on a, uh, in a Word doc or something and save it. Where is the M? There it is. This one is from Ravy. I can bring it up as a backdrop, select my artwork, my magic wand, click on it, and there you go. Then I could make that into an applique. So simple. OK, let's move over quickly to My Block Piecer. Now, My Block Piecer does a lot of the same things in terms of the artwork icon, does the exact same things in the exact same way as Quilt Embellisher does, which is great. But here's something that Block Piecer does that's a little different. Block Piecer allows you to add a seam allowance. For example, the design I have up right here is an applique design. If I was having um, a weak moment and decided to do this as a needle turn applique, I could select this entire design and go to uh, my cutter tool and I want to give it a seam allowance of an eighth of an inch. So I'll do 0.125 and click apply. And then let me get it somewhere where you can see it a little bit better. These are all pretty small. It would put at an eighth of an inch seam allowance for me. If I put this on paper as my hoop, instead of um, a mat for my cutter. Let's see, paper is down here. I'll do a letter size. Let's pick a bigger one. Okay, can you see there's a slight seam allowance around there? Or I could send it directly to my cutter and it would cut it out with an eighth of an inch seam allowance. Now, if I'm going to do this by machine, which is absolutely more likely in my case, then I'm going to select everything and go to my cutter and keep the default, um, no, I want to change the seam allowance to zero and apply and let's do four repeats of this because I want four of these going around in a um, square to make the whole medallion and apply that. And now when you look at these, there's no seam allowance. So when I send it to my cutter, it's going to cut them out the exact size that I want them. And I'll, I would put an applique material on the back, like Steam of Seam 2 or Steam of Seam Light or something like that, so that when they're done, they've got the applique material on the back. I can stick them down 
maybe fuse them if I need to, um, if it's not sticky enough to put it in exactly the right place, but they're precision cut and perfect. And do you know how fast applique goes when you do something like this, where it's pre-cut for you? All you have to do as soon as it stitches that placement line is peel the paper off, put this, to, or not in, in the case of a mat, um, if you're cutting a mat with a cutter, it would be sticky already. Just put it exactly in place on your fabric, and then press go to do your tack down in your finishing stitch. So that's one of the things that my uh, block piecer can do for us, even if we're not piecing blocks. Any questions on that one, Dory? No, that one was really good. That's a great way to explain the differences. Yeah, well, and with my... Well, well, the other thing with my um, block piecer, my block piecer is about sizing, measuring, and cutting, okay? And to top all that off, it can also piece in the hoop. It's not about the actual quilting. So let's take, let's open up a new file, and if I bring in artwork from my block library, We'll do, oh, let's see, diamond in a square. Let's pull, oh, I love this one, checkerboard. I'm going to open that. I'm just going to go with a default size of 8 by 8 since I'm virtually quilting. Um, this is all artwork. And what the software allows us to do is a couple of things. I can resize this if I want to make this into a border. All I have to do is, you know, I could play with squishing it, or I could come over to my properties box in the upper right-hand corner and say, I actually want that to be 10.5 inches wide and uh, 4.75 inches tall, and apply that. And of course, it does all the math for you and figures out how big each of these pieces need to be. So I could then send that artwork to my cutter tool to do a couple of things. I could do it as um, on paper, which if I'm going to print it on, um, a lot of times if I'm, I'm cutting things out with my rotary cutter, like I usually do with triangles and, and squares, because it's fairly easy. I will print these templates out on print and stick target paper. So I have a sticky template, <laughs> and I can just slap those down on the fabric. I don't have to measure or anything, because it just prints a, an, at the outline, including the seam allowance that I've selected, and I slap them down, use my rotary cutter and a ruler for the straight edge, and chop those up in no time. Um, if I do want to send them to my cutter, maybe they're a little more complicated pieces, or there's, you know, five-sided or something like that, um, I'll send those to the cutter. And use, instead of paper, I'll select my silhouette, you know, 12 by 12 map and apply that and save it. And when I save it, at that point, I can select in this software, I can select to save it as an SVG or an FCM. I don't have to export it to save the artwork. I can save it in my quilt, uh, my block piecer. I have to export it to save it as an FCM in my quilt plant, I mean my quilt embellisher. So just look and see what your options are, whether it's export or save, um, to see which is the better alternative for, for what you want to do. Questions? Nope, not so far. I think you've got them. Okay, so I do want to point out one other thing. Going back to um, my quilt embellisher, if I take a design and let's see, let me pick one that's got, okay, uh, like this one. I have an applique design, but I also have artwork in here. I've got both artwork and applique. I can save this, save as, and click on my file types here, scroll down. I can save that as an SVG, which will save the entire file. 
It will show me the stitches and everything. If I just want the shapes of the applique, then I want to export my artwork, or I only want to save my artwork. Does that make sense? And that's really where it gets a little bit complicated. If you only want the artwork, you can always export it to any of the artwork files. And we haven't taken away, um, and we never will, take away your ability to save those as um, FCM or uh, SVG. You can, um, if you can't save them, then export them, and you're in good shape. Okay, so can I talk about next month? Yes, you can. Okay, I want everybody to go home and play with the artwork, because it's really fun. And next month, we're going to do something really um, unique. really fun, unique, thank you. Um, it's going to be um, Stop Tamara. I am looking for blocks to create in my block piecer, because we have a lot of requests on, well, how do I make this block, or how do I make that block? Because we all know that, you know, almost 1,100 blocks are not enough. You want to make different blocks. I am, I am putting out a challenge that um, anyone can send me blocks that at this email address that they would like to see made in my block piecer, and I will go through, I don't know that I'll get to all of them, it'll depend on, on how many we get in, but to analyze a block and teach you how to analyze it and look at it and see what you can do and what you can't do um, and how you would create it. So send me your blocks um, and, you know, just the way you get them and see them, if you're seeing it in a magazine and you want to take a picture of it or you're seeing it on Pinterest and it's already got fabric in it. Um, I've, I've played with them all, and I would love to um, accept the challenge of making blocks that you want to see. Ooh, I'm looking forward to this because I'm going to stump you. Oh, well, good. Um, it's it's fun. It's a it's a nice brain game, and um, and it's a puzzle. And if any of you like puzzle solving, you're gonna love next month's webinar because um, it'll teach you how to kind of work around the edges and fix it and make and it work. My friend Patty wants a slight clarification. Is it supposed to be a sewn block, like a mariner's compass, or? Um, or what? Or is like, it a uh, virtual block? Oh, honey, I virtually quilt all the time. It can be either one. Um, okay. it, it can be a picture. I mean, I here's what I do for entertainment on a Friday night. <laughs> um traveling or not, usually, uh, is I, I love to go on Pinterest and look at the quilt blocks and go, God, could I do that in Block Piecer? How much of it could I do in Block Piecer? You know, what, what, um, I, I really want to teach you all the fun ins and outs of Block Piecer because I just think it's such an exciting program that does so many things that, you know, it is a patented process and you know, honestly, when I first got the software and started playing with it, I thought, oh, well, this is great for those people who, who don't know how to chain piece or do this or do that. But what I found out was it saves me time and errors because it does all of the math for me. It does the things that I don't want to do. And the challenge is to be able to make the blocks you want to make and save the time and um the effort and not make the errors. So send them in, ladies um, look, and gentlemen. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Okay. I'm good. Thank you all for coming in. Um, see you next month.